Good evening, and welcome to this panel discussion on Nord Stream 2 and the future of Baltic energy security. It's hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge, and I'm very grateful to the director of the centre, Professor Brendan Sims, and his colleagues for their support in this event. This is the seventh in this Baltic geopolitical programme series, but it's also the first in a series of what will become regular events, which we're going to call contemporary Baltic challenges. Later this year, we hope to have events on the impact of the German elections on the Baltic and on the COP26 summit in Glasgow and what its impact will be for the Baltic. We've had a lot of interest in our events, I'm delighted to say, and uh, working with our colleagues in the network of universities in the region, we're now building a substantial programme of events and activities in a regular newsletter. If you're watching this and you haven't yet done so, please sign up to receive our regular material. 142 people have registered for this event. It's an online video panel. We will end at 6 p.m. UK time promptly. And I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour. And then in the second half, I will relay questions from the audience to our panelists. You as the audience will be able to see and hear me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically in the audience so at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in this webinar. However, you are still able to communicate with me and the panelists. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option. Click on it, and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you type questions, please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question is for a specific panelist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try to cover as many of your questions as possible, though in view of the large numbers we've got and the time constraints, we might not be able to address everyone's questions. Finally, I also want to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and will be available after the event and we'll post the recording on our website. As I say, the, the subject for this evening is Nord Stream 2 and the future of Baltic energy security. It is the longest subsea pipeline in the world. It's 95% complete. And this event is certainly very contemporary. We've just in the last couple of weeks President Biden's US administration deciding to waive sanctions on Nord Stream 2. And just a few days later, Annalena Baerbock, the Green candidate for the chancellorship of Germany to succeed Angela Merkel, stated that she didn't intend, if elected, to go ahead with the pipeline. And of course, the remarkable events relating to Belarus in the last day or so uh, have brought this subject also into uh, prominence. The concept of this event is to try and deal with the question of where is Nord Stream 2 going? What does the outcome, whatever it is, mean for energy security in the Baltic and the North Sea? We see the Baltic Sea region as currently in the grip of a three-sided ordering struggle between NATO, the European Union and Russia, in which the alignments do not always follow those of their respective camps. Nowhere has this been more the case as with this issue the oil and gas pipeline intended to take energy from Russia across the Baltic directly to Germany, bypassing Poland and the Ukraine. The project has been strongly opposed by many Baltic Sea regional states and also by the United Kingdom. Uh, as the new administration of Professor President Biden gears up to tackle this, we're bringing together a panel of experts to discuss where this contention, contentious project is hearing next and what the implications are for energy and regional security, and what is Britain's interest in the eventual outcome. As I said a moment ago, the panel will last an hour, with 20 minutes for the three opening presentations in total, and then for the remaining 40 minutes, Q&A to the panel from, yourself, from myself and from you, the participants. We have an excellent panel. I'll introduce them in detail as they start, but they're Kirsten Westphal, Sir Philip Lowe, and Daniel Kovczynski, uh, MP. And this panel will make presentations each for five to seven minutes. And then, as I say, we'll go to questions. Now, our first panelist is Kirsten Westphal. She works at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And she's head of their project on the geopolitics of energy transformation. And of course, the German geopolitical dimension is a very important one. 
and Kirsten is going to describe the political and strategic conflicts which will have to be resolved for the pipeline to be taken to completion. She's based in Potsdam at the moment and that's where she's speaking from and Kirsten I'm delighted to introduce you and welcome what you have to say in kicking us off this evening. Kirsten Vestfall. Thank you very much Charles. I'm delighted to be with you. I would like to make three points um, discussing the German um, position as, as we prepared. My first point is that Nord Stream 2 has become a con controversial project in Germany for quite some time. And that is, this is the case because, of course, the project has geopolitical and economic dimensions. It's an ambivalent, ambiguous and contradictory project. And the predominant cleavage runs actually across and not between parties. So it splits more economic experts versus foreign and security experts in all parties. And this is due to the case that um, any large infrastructure project, of course, has economic and political dimensions. But I think Nord Stream 2 is, is, is a very special case because it has become highly politically loaded over time. It is a political symbol of how, what, how is one stand on Russia, on fossil fuels, etc. Since it has been kicked off in 2015, the political landscape has, of course, changed and deteriorated compared to 2015. This is due also to um, the German-Russian relationship. Think about the Tiergarten murder, the Navalny case, the provocations this year in eastern Ukraine, and also the hybrid threats we are witnessing and the reports on that. And on the other hand, the US unilateral sanctions, of course, under Trump administration, which were taken no longer in consultation with the EU partners, um, and which have rather externalized the cost on German and European companies, are also pressuring and have pressured from the other side and have made the issue an issue of national sovereignty and also undermining actually use major tool of regulation. So this created a feeling in Berlin that Germany is somehow between a rock and a hard place and has also pushed Berlin more and more to leave its, well, you might say comfort zone or at least its fallback position that was all the time based on the then existing in 2015 legal framework, but also the fallback uh, position that was based on um, Germany's, the German government's views that was sharing the economic uh, considerations of the um, companies involved. So let me quickly say something about the economic dimension that has been taken into consideration as my second point. So kind of the German government's position was A, to compartmentalize the issue, to rely and emphasize interdependence as a means to keep costs high for further deterioration of the relationship and to point to a commercial character of the project, which meant in the German case that it, it was not financed by public money, but rather by companies. And the issue of energy sovereignty was seen as, or energy security was seen as a consequence of geology. So not that many suppliers left for natural gas, Groningen and production in the Netherlands going down, also the German production. So that left Europe with Russia, Norway, Algeria plus LNG. And the other point was the geography where we witnessed that the big demand and supply centers, both in Europe and in Russia, moved to the north. And this meant that we, we, the, a new pipeline was built to link the new um, gas fields on the Yamal Peninsula with its major consuming markets. And this was also a stress that the pipeline is shorter than the other ones by 1,000 kilometers. And the other point with regard to energy security was certainly that um, the real consumption that we saw in the past years was um, basically on the pathway that the Prognos study, which was the basis for the application process of Nord Stream 2, was really right in laying the path or in other terms, the German consumption of gas volumes has even been above, slightly above 
the estimated volumes. And that was also the case um, even in the corona year. And climate policy was also an intervening fact factor, but there the issue was more than um, that there would be the guess that there would be more consumption in natural gas in future because Germany, of course, is facing out nuclear, but also um, coal. So there you had the expectance that, of course, um, we would see more natural gas up to 2030 and even more so we shouldn't think about the yearly volumes that will be needed in the German consumption but rather more capacities and flexibility because of the expected seasonal effects with a coincidence temporal coincidence of cold spells and the so-called Dunkelflaute where you would have no wind and sun so this was kind of the point that even if you um, move forward with climate policies, that would mean more natural gas for a um, transitional period of time. And of course, in Germany, there was also, and this is the third point, a fallout on Ukraine. This was, of course, seen, and this was a concern. And this was why Germany was very engaged in striking the compromise that was achieved at the end of December 2019. Um, and in Germany, this is not perceived as a consequence of US pressure, but rather as a logic result of, well, the no negotiations, but also of coinciding interests in obtaining transit. Um, so this was, is, is, is always stressed that there have been volumes secured in the first year 65 BCM through Ukraine, and in the following years till 2024, 40 BCM. So my third and final point is what is next? We've seen the 17th May report under the PISA, but um, uh, sanctions, but with waivers for, um, yeah, um, uh, um, uh, Mr. Warnick, uh, but also other offices of Nord Stream 2. And it was very clear um, that this was done in consultation with the allies. And as you said, Charles, there's not that much left. Um, so it's most likely that construction will be finished before German elections in sept on September 26. Um, and it's not that um, likely that it will be a huge issue in the election campaign, although, of course, there are differences in the election programs of the different parties. Um, and like um, parties like the Greens or the Liberal Democrats, they have stressed that they would like to stop construction or have a moratorium on construction or would at least um, um, imply the gas directive um, and, and even in the, in the case of the green ones, clearly stopping Nord Stream 2 for foreign and, and climate reasons. So this is where we stand now. And I think the, the crucial question will really be looking into the next phase after construction is completed and to see how the technical acceptance of the pipeline will be done and how the gas directive will be implemented. Thank you very much. Kirsten, thank you very much for that very, very clear summary of the issues that are at stake at the moment, and also for being ready to uh, put your neck on the line a little bit about what you think will happen in the future, which is most interesting. Um, our second panellist is Sir Philip Lowe. Uh, Sir Philip is a former Director General for Energy in the European Commission, so the senior official uh, uh, at the uh, European Commission for Dealing with Energy Matters, uh, in which capacity he had to negotiate uh, with the owners of uh, Nord Stream about other pipeline projects and was, was intimately involved in many of the discussions and with hand-to-hand -hand experience of negotiating with people promoting such projects. We're delightful, delighted, Philip, that you're able to join us. Uh, you're going to describe the impact of completion, or for that matter, non-completion of the pipeline upon future European Union energy security and sustainability, referring also perhaps to the economic cost of the project. Uh, you're based at the moment on the site of the Battle of Waterloo, which is where you're uh, broadcasting from. So I think with Kirsten coming from 
uh, uh, Potsdam, and Daniel shortly going to come from uh, the House of, uh, House of Parliament in London, and yourself from Waterloo, you feel impact from key strategic centres of Europe. So, Philip, we're very much looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to take part in this, in this debate. Just two preliminary remarks on, on the project itself, and there's, there's less than 10% of pipeline to be constructed. So um, when we talk about um, will the project go ahead, the project physically is almost complete. Um, and then as far as the profitability of the project is concerned, well, this is not a uh, profitability of a project in Russia is looked at differently from the profitability in on, a, on any commercial basis. It's much more strategic. Uh, so um, even if we, even if the project may not be profitable from a commercial point of view, it may go ahead in any case. This is my first two introductory remarks. As far as the strategic um, importance of, of this pipeline and gas for Russia on the one hand and Europe on the other is concerned, clearly Europe is energy dependent for the moment. Its reaction to that is to diversify its security of supply, whether it's uh, with, the, with respect to uh, developing uh, renewables or indeed, in some cases, nuclear, um, but also to, to create a single integrated, interconnected European market in Europe so that no part of the European Union itself would remain an energy island. That is to say, it is no longer, it would be no longer the case that, for example, the Baltic states would be dependent either on gas or, or on electricity for supplies, um, because there would be a strong emphasis on interconnection with Western European markets for both electricity and gas. This is not so far the case for electricity. The Baltics remain dependent on Russian electricity in their systems, but it is, it is the case more and more for, for uh, gas, where we have not only just uh, LNG facilities being developed in Lithuania and elsewhere, but also interconnectors between Finland and the Baltic states, between um, uh, Finland, Norway, uh, north of Germany, etc., which is the first and uh, first response of the European Union to the issue of security of supply in itself. Now, on the Russian side, of course, they have energy independence on fossil fuels, but they have economic dependence on export of fossil fuels. They are economically dependent on their export of oil, gas, and coal, and the European Union remains, despite attempts to develop uh, links with China, uh, the major importer of Russian uh, fossil fuels. Um, and the Russian attitude to development of infrastructures to the West, um, don't forget that the pipelines from Ukraine, uh, across Ukraine, were not originally planned to have a Philip, we've just lost connection for a second. Could you go back a moment or two? Your connection just went. No, I can't. Uh, we've lost you there, Philip, I'm afraid. Philip, I can't. Uh, you, it's your back now. Philip, we lost you for a little while there. Yeah, okay. Just, just, just the, for, on the Russian side, the real emphasis was on provide, uh, ensuring a security of demand through provision of the infrastructures necessary to deliver Russian gas to, to Europe. Now, that, of course, came into, into conflict directly with the European Union's 
objective of diversifying, of creating a competitive market within the single uh, energy market in Europe. Now, of course, gas, as Kirsten has uh, mentioned, um, has been looked at as uh, at least as a transition fuel in the uh, transition towards a low carbon economy uh, because of its complementarity with uh, renewables. Uh, but gradually, with the development of alternative technologies and the uh, the expertise now being devoted to managing a system which is based primarily on renewables, the gas set could be transitional, but it doesn't look like being a final fuel. Now, the Russian approach, whether it's on North Stream 1 or North Stream 2, was to try to embed the uh, reliance on gas from from the east, and that em embedding of the relationship between Russia and Germany and elsewhere in the European Union was threatened only by one thing from a Russian point of view, which was the precarity of the relationships with its transit countries, Belarus, Moldova, Slovakia, Ukraine, in particular, Ukraine. And so, there was a lot of um, concern expressed both in Germany and Russia about that precarity, which led to Nord Stream 1, which uh, uh, obviously provided Russia with the security of demand it wanted, uh, obviously provided Germany and other countries at the west of Europe with more security of supply, but put into question um, the um, security of supply in, in countries uh, such as uh, Poland, Slovakia and elsewhere, who um, not only needed Russian gas on competitive basis, but for certain countries like the Ukraine and others, um, the transit fees which were paid for transmitting gas across their territories were a significant part of their revenue. And don't forget that even in, in uh, up to 2019, um, half of Russian gas transited through the Ukraine uh, and not through, not as much through the North Stream. Now, uh, the European Union in its attitude to North Stream and the pipelines which, um, which uh, were downstream from North Stream had, has, has tried to, uh, to um, have a relatively restrictive approach to in, to ensure that the, that extra supply of Russian gas does not result in a um, strengthening of their dominant position on markets for gas, whether it's in, in, in Czechia or Czech Republic or elsewhere. That was difficult legally at a certain time because it didn't seem to be possible to impose uh, conditions on uh, pipelines which were outside the territory or partially outside the territory of the European Union. That was changed in 2019 to allow the EU to impose conditions on those pipelines. And um, whether or not uh, uh, the Russian government, which I remember very distinctly, disliked the third package liberalization in the European Union, the gas directive, the reality is that they have to, had to accept it. And the, the, the European Commission's uh, competition department, which I was also ahead of, uh, took a case against Gazprom. And the result was that uh, Gazprom had to settle with the, the Commission and had to promise not to uh, ban, not to uh, uh, put any conditions on, for example, reverse flow of gas back into Ukraine or Slovakia uh, from, for example, North Stream had to agree that there would be no ex export bans and no destination clauses. So basically, the, the gas pump remains one of the major suppliers into the single energy market in Europe, but had, has, has to accept the conditions which have been applied to it. Can now, can you begin to bring your remarks to a close, please? Yeah. And the, where, where are we now? We're in the 
a situation where um, this project is going to be uh, physically implemented, the uh, links it has and exemptions which may be provided to allow Gazprom to use a significant proportion of this, these, inf these pipelines is in question. There is still an ongoing case before the Court of Justice on the use of the Opal pipeline. And uh, one would expect, therefore, that uh, despite uh, Russian, uh, Russian reticence, uh, the uh, conditions of the third package, that is to say, liberalization of a single integrated interconnected market in Europe, are going to be imposed. Um, that puts into question, to a certain extent, the arguments on the other side that this this um, uh, project needs to be stopped because it hurts security of supply in Poland and in the Baltic states, for example. Because once Poland and the Baltic states are really, as they are becoming now, physically interconnected with the rest of Europe, the, the need for um, some imposition of conditions on Russia is less important because gas is available elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Philip, for a, a really clear overview of the situation. Many thanks indeed. Uh, we've had two excellent starts. Our third panellist, uh, coming from the Palace of Westminster in London, is Daniel Kovczynski. Um, he's a Conservative Member of Parliament for Shrewsbury and Atcham uh, in the UK since 2005. He was born in Warsaw uh, and came to the UK, I think, Daniel, at the age of six, and currently chairs the Poland all-party parliamentary group in the UK Parliament, which is one of the uh, most active of the all-party groups in Parliament. Uh, Daniel, I saw from your gestures that you didn't agree with every single word that was being spoken by Kirsten and Philip, um, but uh, no doubt you may wish to comment on that if you wish to do so. But the principal question I hope you can address is, why is the UK interested in this at all? Uh, what are the UK interests in this matter? How can they best be taken into account now the UK is not in the European Union. Many thanks for joining us. We appreciate you giving the time. And so, Daniel, you're our third panellist this evening. Thank you very much, Daniel Kopczynski. Well, thank, well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, that you have uh, had to see my genuine concerns as to what the previous two panellists have said. There are other friends of mine online who have expressed concerns about my vocal um, and facial concerns and distortions as to what I've heard <laughs> so far from Philip Noe and Kirsten Westphal. But let me say to you unequivocally, sir, if I may, and I have every confidence in you as a former Home Secretary here in the United Kingdom and one that was generally perceived to be very competent in that role. That's a role that uh, is the uh, uh, death knell for many politicians here in the United Kingdom and you fulfilled that role with great alacrity, if I may say so, and fortitude during your time as Home Secretary. But let me say this, why I so strongly disagree with Philip and Kirsten. And I'm speaking to you as the first of a Polish born British member of parliament of now 16 years standing. What the two previous speakers have failed to recognize is that Germany is not complying with basic principles of its membership of the European Union. Germany is very uh, erudite at uh, instructing other EU nations as to what they may or may not do under the premise of their membership of the European Union. And we do not have, unfortunately, the time at the moment in this one hour discussion for me to be able to explain to you all of the areas in which Germany has legally through the EU courts and the panoply of other measures that it has at its disposal, at its disposal 
in putting pressure on countries in Central and Eastern Europe to comply with what it perceives to be common EU standards and principles. I would argue that Germany is flying in the face of a common EU energy policy. I would also say that, and this is relevant to the United Kingdom, it is behaving in a way not compliant with its responsibilities as a member of NATO. And this is where Britain comes to the fore. NATO is an exclusive club of 30 nations, probably the most successful military alliance in my lifetime. And I speak to you as somebody who is 49 years of age. NATO hasn't lost the square inch of territory since its inception, inception 70 years ago. But Germany is behaving in a way completely out of kilter and sync with its responsibilities as a NATO partner, undermining, denigrating the energy security of key NATO allies in the Baltic, Poland, but also in future potential bold. Uh, NATO allies like Ukraine and Belarus. We may today have concerns about President Lukashenko, but one day you and I know that Belarus will be a free and democratic nation, as will Ukraine, as is Ukraine, and that those two countries may one day, in conjunction with Georgia, want to join the NATO partnership, NATO family. And by the way, when you undermine these countries to the extent that Germany is doing now, it is completely out of kilter with its responsibility as a NATO partner. Many of us, many people like uh, Mr. Lowe and Kirsten Westphal, many of us, will have in the past denigrated us for having the temerity for speaking out against German domination of the European Union. They will have also denigrated us for having the temerity to campaign to leave the European Union. But one thing that history has taught us, Mr. Clark, is that on our continent, a homogeny, homogeny and a single perspective has always been very, very deleterious to our common defense and security. We need the strongest possible internal debate on our continent in order to be able to challenge and stand up to modern challenges that we face as a continent and as individual nations. And unfortunately, the Franco-German axis has become so omnipotent, so powerful, so Orwellian, that no other smaller na nation has the ability to challenge it. And so to answer your specific question, what can the United Kingdom do? Well, the United Kingdom can and must fulfill its historical obligation, which is to challenge the Germans and their perception of what is relevant and appropriate for our continent. The Germans do not have a monopoly of wisdom on our continent. The Germans do not have a monopoly of what should happen, and nor do they have the right as to what should happen on our continent. And the United Kingdom, unfettered by the artificial constraints of our membership of the European Union, is a permanent member of the UN Security Council and a key ally of the United States of America, must challenge Germany and through them, the German Franco-German axis in its appalling violations of all things basic to the security of our continent. Unfortunately, President, Tr Tr President Trump has obviously left office. Many of you will have uh, very little sympathy for him. What concerns me is President Biden and Secretary Blinken 
in the sense that they are saying that we must comply with and we don't want to upset the Germans and we must do what they uh, perceive to be in their interests. No, no, no. If a German country is, if a European country is behaving out of kilter with the interests of NATO and out of kilter with the interests of many of our allies in Central and Eastern Europe, we in the United Kingdom need to vocally, courageously outline the mistakes that they are making in giving the Russians an umbilical cord to the center of the heart of Europe a vital artery to themselves while bypassing our allies in Central and Eastern Europe. The Germans want to say this, finally, Mr. Clark, I'm all right, Jack. I've got my energy supplies and I'm buying them cheaply from Russia. I've decided to negate my nuclear power alternatives for my own domestic considerations, I'm going to buy my gas cheaply from the Russians. And by the way, as a result of that, I am going to put in danger and at risk the security of Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. And I think that is highly irresponsible, highly selfish, and it's for the United Kingdom as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and as a country unfettered by the common constraints of that artificial membership of the European Union that will today and in the future has, have to stand up to that unrealistic and selfish domination of our continent. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think you'll all agree, our audience, that we've got uh, a good robust discussion going and opening it up. And I thank all our panelists for that. Uh, with very sharp opinions. We've already had a few people coming in. So can I just firstly say to all of you who'd like to uh, ask questions or anything of that kind, use that Q&A button. And I'm going to kick off with the first three questions, which I'll then ask the panelists to respond. The first is from Mark Denman uh, in Norfolk, asking a pretty factual question, i.e. who has paid the enormous cost of construction so far? Uh, who would stand to lose if the project were not completed? Where has the money come from to actually construct the pipeline? The second, which is specifically targeted at Philip, is do you think that a significant capacity restriction could be imposed on Nord Stream 2, either by the German regulator or the e European Union, and whether the US will have an influence on that process? That's come from uh, Dr. Kachi Yafimava from the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, trying to establish uh, how capacity restrictions could actually be imposed. And she's targeted her question, Philip, directly at you with your uh, energy regulation experience. And then Marko Tomikic, a lawyer from Zagreb in Croatia, targets his question at Mr. Kavshinsky. He says, if we're already talking about the importance for peace in Europe and given the causes and implications of World War II, isn't it really important that we have a strong connection between Moscow and Berlin, he argues. Um, and then he's, he takes uh, issue with uh, Daniel, your what he calls very annoying generalization of entire peoples, Germans and Russians, and trying to uh, make the point that there's divisions of opinion and interest within those people. So I'm going to go around the group and perhaps kick off with you, Kirsten, on this point about who actually paid the cost of construction, who would stand to lose. What's your understanding of that? Well, my understanding is, is of course, that it's um, nearly 10 billion euro project and 50% is coming from Gazprom. And then from the five European companies as uh, financial supporters of the project. But indeed, it's, it's not very transparent at the moment how much funds have been really paid. And this is, well, also partly, I say partly, um, a consequence of US sanctions pressure, which um, is of course um, a difficulty for the companies involved. So some have um, openly said that they have withdrawn. So what is clearly the case, if if 
there the project will not be operating it will be of course um, um, lost rents for for russia and gazprom but also for the Euro european companies that were involved thank you that's very clear kirsten and philip on this point about who can impose capacity restrictions on the pipeline um uh, it, where is, is that a German regulation? Is it the European Commission, European in operating? And what's US influence in that process? It's, it's European, um, European law, which is implemented both by uh, the German regulators and by the Commission. By the way, in terms of uh, artificial controls, let, let it be, let's be clear. The reason why the present Nord Stream 1 can only be used by up to 50% for Russian gas, up to 50% for the Nord Stream 1 is because of uh, conditions imposed by the European Union. And the, the present um, debate in uh, present uh, appeals in the European courts Uh, in re relation to that 50% lines from Nord Stream 1 is, um, is uh, before the, Euro the final court of the European Union, which is not artificial, which is actually dealing with a serious legal issue, is addressing exactly what our colleague uh, from, from um, the House of Commons has said, uh, energy solidarity. To what extent um, is um, the... Um, the um, any member state of the European Union, uh, should it t take into account, and it should do in terms of the basic principles of the European Union, the interests of other parts of other member states. That being said, as I emphasized before, and I don't think this is a question of um, a taking sides vis-a-vis uh, -vis different member states, but a matter of law and a, a matter of policy in terms of uh, security of supply um, is the way forward for security of supply to simply impose restrictions on Russian gas or is the way forward to build interconnectors as, ha as uh, our colleague will know have been done at the expense of European funds um, from Poland to Lithuania from from uh, from Estonia to Finland the Baltic interconnector to all these investments have gone on in order to bring the Baltic states and the, the other parts of the European Union inside the, 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 the market in Europe. And the same is true um, irrespective of whether they're uh, part of the European Union or not. Uh, the, the laws of the European Union have been imposed so that reverse flow of gas into Ukraine to prevent any kind of turning off of the tap by Russia it is now possible, and um, the the um, negotiations with Gazprom have proved that. So yes, there is significant room for manoeuvre to impose more capacity restrictions. We're waiting, obviously, on the view of the court on the basic principle of solidarity. But the issue of solidarity is not simply a question of how much restrictions should we have on Russian gas, but how 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 can we help countries in Eastern Europe um, to ensure that they have maximum security of supply from whatever source. And in the, in the energy transition at the moment, gas is not the only instrument to that. Um, as far as the relationships politically between the European, European countries and Moscow consent, they're not very much different from the relationships uh, which the UK has. Um, there has to be some kind of robust uh, uh, declaration and statement on what our interests are, and they must be defended by whatever means. But the inside the European Union, the Russians, uh, Russian themselves will say this, that they have met with stubborn resistance to any concession on use of their facilities within the, within the single market of the European Union. That's, um, I, I don't want to comment on, on whether this is pro-German or anti-German. I'm talking about the 27 member states of the European Union or 
uh, as it was, you know, when I was negotiating with them uh, in tough negotiations, there were 28 of us. Thank you, Philip. Now, Daniel, um, I mentioned the question that had come in from Marco Tomicic about um, the uh, uh, what he calls the importance of having a strong connection between Moscow and Berlin. And perhaps I can just add to that a further question that's come in from Mass Massimiliano Dore, uh, who says he agrees, Daniel, with what you said, that there's indeed an, a win-win situation between Russia and Germany at the expense of the other neighbor country. And how would you lever leverage a strategy with Germany to bring it towards the European interest? So, Daniel, would you perhaps deal with that first question I mentioned, but also the other one that's come in from Massimiliano Dore? Well, I will try to, Mr. Clark, but what I would say to you is this. The United Kingdom has signed a, a relationship with Ukraine um, in March of, I think, so in February or March of this year, a security, um, military, a security and economic agreement with Ukraine. Um, when I was on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee uh, in the House of Commons, we visited Donetsk and Lugansk. It's the only time in my career as being a Conservative Member of Parliament for 16 years, not as long as you, Mr. Clark, but for 16 years of being a Conservative Member of Parliament. And it's the only time that I felt that um, when I went to Donetsk and Lugansk, it was the only time that I felt I was walking on the face of the moon. Uh, so complete was the destruction of the landscape around us when we visited Donetsk and Lugansk, that I felt that the power of Russia to intimidate and blackmail and destroy our fellow European partners is something that I had seen for the first time in my lifetime. Um, I had read stories about uh, Warsaw in 1944, um, but this is the first time that I had seen total destruction in my lifetime. And so when you see that sort of uh, situation on the continent of Europe, you start to grow a certain level of uh, distrust and concern about the conduct of this extraordinary power uh, on our continent of Europe, which is namely Russia. And, you know, this pipeline is going to deprive Ukraine of $4 billion a year. I think that's the conservative uh, estimate. It may be far more, but I would use the conservative estimate of depriving Ukraine of $4 billion a year of transit fees and making sure that this gas goes through the Ukrainian territory to its more lucrative markets in the West. I've been to the Polish oil and gas company where they have shown me where the Russians haven't turned off supplies, but what they've done is very cleverly, cleverly is to turn the knob to a certain degree and to a certain increment to demonstrate their omnipotence in the supply of gas and energy and that they can and will have a deleterious impact on certain economic activities in Poland unless all of their wishes are complied with. This pipeline enables the Russians, gives them a much greater fortitude power and resilience to continue to intimidate, blackmail, and threaten our security partners in Central and Eastern Europe, because of course, they will now have finally the ability to completely turn off the taps while supplying their lucrative Western markets in Germany and France and beyond. Former President Trump sat round a breakfast table with Jens Stoltenberg, the Norwegian Secretary General of NATO, and he said this to him. If you Google it, Mr. Clark, he will say that he said this. By the way, if there's one thing I believe in, it's NATO. 
30 countries uh, being members of this exclusive club, which has, hasn't lost a square inch of territory since its inception 70 years ago. But President Trump said this to Jens Stoltenberg, what is the purpose of you telling us to defend your continent with American soldiers? And by the way, we are sending American soldiers to the Baltic States and Poland on the rotational basis. What is the purpose of you instructing us as American taxpayers, as American citizens, to continue to send our soldiers at the risk of their lives and to continue to send tens of billions of American dollars for the protection of Central and Eastern Europe when you are giving, when Germany is giving tens of billions of dollars directly to our potential adversary. Mr. Clark, I used to take my daughter to the Polish-Russian border every, every year on summer holidays. There's a, there's a resort called Piaski in Poland where I used to take my daughter every year on holiday. And I turned around to her and I said, darling, this is where NATO meets, this is where NATO meets Russia. This is the most highly militarized part of Europe. On that side of the border is a massive, massive installation of rockets, tanks, military equipment, radar installations. These people are ready to attack and intimidate and threaten and cajole not just Poland, but the whole of NATO. Mr. Trump, former President Trump was absolutely right. What is the purpose of the British taxpayers spending so much money in defending the whole of the continent of Europe from a potential Russian aggression, which by the way, we already see on the border between Russia and Poland, when the Germans are going out of their way to supply our potential adversary with tens of billions of dollars every year for their energy supplies. Thank and you. the last thing I would say to, the, to you is this, Mr. Clark, according to the House of Commons, the United Kingdom only purchases 2.1% of all gas supplies, actually potentially less than 2% of all gas supplies from Russia. That should also be the case for the Germans. Okay, thank you very much. We've got the combination of the uh, polemical, if I can put it like that, and the factual situation about what's going to happen. And that's reflected in the final three questions that have come in, which I'm then going to ask you all to respond to again. David Coleman asks, without Nord Stream, where will Germany and others get their gas? If it didn't work, where would Germany get its gas? Um, Iris Lampropopoulou from uh, a student at the University of Piraeus in Greece uh, addresses the question that Philip's been raising about the EU energy market. What are the realistic options the EU has in order to diversify energy supply. She's demonstrating some scepticism towards the proposition that it will be possible to diversify the energy supply. And then a final geopolitical question from Georgia, um, from Konstantin Mishvili, who says, I represent the organization Georgia Three Seas Initiative, and I have a question for Mr. Kaczynski as a politician, and I know Daniel, that you've written on the subject of the Three Seas Initiative from time to time. Uh, he says he is a Georgian citizen, and for me, the completion of the Nord Stream 2 means more Russia in Europe and less Georgia in Europe. Two years ago, Mr. Rasmussen, the former NATO Secretary General, said that it was a mistake not to give Georgia membership, a membership action plan for NATO in 2008. He also said openly that it didn't happen because of the position of Germany and France. How do you think, he asks, will the completion of Nord Stream 2 influence NATO's open door policy towards new members? You referred to that in your initial presentation. So Philip, can I come first to you, uh, answer any of those questions as you wish, uh, but in particular the point about uh, how realistic is it to say that the EU can diversify energy supply in your view? Well, there's one thing which the UK and the EU has in common that they're absolutely committed to a transition towards a low carbon economy. And by definition, use of coal, first of all, which is a major export of Russia, and 
also uh, uh, natural gas is going to contribute in the longer term uh, far too much CO2 emissions. And therefore, whatever, whatever the horizon is for Nord Stream 2 as an investor, I would put it as rather short. And I said at the beginning, we're not responsible for the profitability of Nord Stream. Um, we're responsible for the security, as, as our colleagues have said, for Europe and for the UK and for NATO as a whole. And um, so for the moment, what are, what are the alternatives for Europe? Well, we we have reliable supplies for from Norway, which is uh, part of the European economic area um, and is in the single energy market in Europe. We have um, uh, more and more sources of LNG, whether from the United States or from from uh, Africa and elsewhere. Um, so even on the issue of LNG and gas, there are plenty of alternatives. Uh, turning it round uh, immediately, if you take Germany and say, well, uh, from now on, you're no longer going to, to import uh, gas from Russia is, is going to be a problem of transition. On the other hand, Germany is very committed to the CO2 emissions objectives. And uh, one would expect that uh, through the expansion of, of uh, renewables, solar, wind, and other forms, we're going to see um, quite a very significant diversification of um, energy supplies in Europe, which is already happening. And it's, it, it's exceeded expectations in all our countries. We used to say that offshore wind was going to be more expensive than nuclear. Now, in the UK and elsewhere, it's, it's become a very competitive option. So um, I don't worry personally, and I'm no longer working for the European Union, I don't worry about the diversification of supplies. It's an inevitability with the uh, energy transition. Thank you. Now, on, 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 on the, you know, I think that's all I can say for the moment. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. We're running towards the end, so I'm going to ask first Daniel and then Kirsten to respond to the questions that are there, and then I shall uh, sum up. Uh, Daniel, the question that was particularly focused towards you was from our colleague from Georgia. Will the completion influence NATO's open door policy? Uh, I'm not sure NATO does actually have an open door policy, but leaving that to one side. Um, would you like to comment on that? I think you've already talked about it to some extent. Well, may I just say, Mr. Clark, how pleased I am about this question. Because in the sense that, where, where do you get the, the, the question is brilliant. Where do you get the gas if you don't get it from Russia? You do what the Poles do. And by the way, may I just say unequivocally, and then speaking as the first ever Polish born British member of parliament, we came to this country in 78, um, because my family were fiercely anti-communist. But what I would say, to, the Poland, I've always had a soft spot for Poland, but the Poles have uh, implemented a brilliant energy strategy, which other European countries ought to emulate. First of all, they have worked constructively with Croatia in formulating the three C's initiative. And by the way, I think very much, very much hope, Mr. Clark, that you have a whole debate on just the three C's initiative and the ramifications for the United Kingdom of the three C's initiative. Uh, 12 countries in Central and Eastern Europe, all of whom are members of the European Union, all of whom are members of NATO, apart from Austria. But isn't it fascinating how these countries are themselves starting to create uh, liquefied gas terminals on their coastlines to import liquefi liquefied gas from uh, friendly nations. In the case of Poland, it has invested billions of dollars at the liquefied gas terminal in Świnoujście, or uh, in uh, Western Poland, to import liquefied gas from Norway, a fellow NATO partner, and the United States of America, a fellow, fellow NATO partner. And may I just say to you, isn't it extraordinary and isn't it peculiar, isn't it rather revolutionary that we ought to be 
buying our gas, liquefied gas, from fellow NATO partners. Being members, of the Euro Na being members of NATO and having the extraordinary privilege that NATO membership affords us, isn't it sensible for us to buy, then build, uh, to then buy our energy resources from fellow NATO partners? So if I was to take you, Mr. Clark, to the liquefied gas terminal in Świnoujście on the Polish Baltic coast, or I was to take you to Croatia, the two nascent uh, instigators of a three seas initiative, they are both building liquefied gas terminals to, in order to import liquefied gas from fellow NATO partners, rather from our potential adversary, Russia. Secondly, and lastly, to answer your point on Georgia, I had the great privilege recently of meeting Sofia Katsarava, the Georgian ambassador to the court of St. James. Mr. Clark, I believe that you will agree with me, this is the only diplomat that we've come across who has a member of the British Empire. I've never come across a foreign diplomat who has a member of the British Empire, MBE, but Sofia Katsarava has, is an MBE. This is a lady who spent her first formative years working for the British Embassy in Tbilisi. Then she became a member of parliament. Now she's the ambassador to the court of St. James. And I have to say to you, I think that um, um, her ability and her determination to ensure that her country joins NATO is something that I support fully. We had courage, we had courage, and this is the last thing I'll say, Mr. Clark, we had courage to stand up for countries in Central and Eastern Europe for them to join NATO in 2004, countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Now we need to demonstrate the same courage to ensure that Ukraine and Georgia and other European countries also have the right to join NATO because we must continue to stand up against the aggression of Russia in trying to suggest that any European country does not have the right to join NATO. That is their right and we will defend it, sir. Kirsten, thank you. You've got the final word of our panel before I finally wind us up. Uh, I don't know which of those questions you'd like to address particularly, whether it's about uh, the question of diversification of energy or of w where Germany might get its gas if Nord Stream didn't happen or the more general geopolitical points. But Kirsten, yours is the final word. Thank you very much, Charles Clark. Well, look, I, I'm working on energy issues. I'm an energy expert and I would like to re react on, 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 the, on these issues. As we heard a lot of the geopolitical um, narratives behind, as you said, um, which is normally very much looking into the geopolitical side of the story, which seems to be, in my point of view, uh, for many, many points, detached from the economic reality. And I think this is what I would like to highlight in, in my remarks. Um, I, I agree that one of the big success stories in Europe was indeed um, the internal market creation for natural gas. So Philip Lowe has mentioned the, 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 the entry trust case against Gazprom. He has mentioned the, the interconnectors, the reverse flows. And I would really say that also the 3SI initiative is a success story with regard to opening, but also integrating Ukraine into the um, energy market. We've seen huge um, storage levels this winter in Ukraine, and we've, we've seen that Ukraine is becoming a part of Eastern Europe. And this is part of the whole story of EU regulation, but also market flows. And, and what I sadly observe still is quite a, a closure, foregone closure of the Polish um, market, which I think the next step should really um, opening up the Polish market after it has diversified as, as um, 
Mr. Kovczynski has described. So I think this is still something to follow to increase the interconnectors and the flows between Germany and um, Poland in particular. My third point or my second point indeed is on, on the energy security issue. And once again, Nord Stream 2 to be very precise. To me, Nord Stream 2 is neither a threat to European energy security, nor is it a must. It's just an add-on which has a price dampening effect, which is important, well, for German industry, for German gas consumers, but also electricity consumers. And it's not just Germany, it's also the Netherlands, it's also Austria looking into that. And I don't see a French-German axis, by the way. It has rather been quite an opposition for some time by France, so, so I, I can't see that point. What does Nord Stream 2 is increasing flexibility and liquidity. And this is why I talked about the price dampening effect. And, and if you ask me diversifying well we have the geography of natural gas supplies and i can only echo what sir, sir, sir philip low has said um, and, and add that there will be more volumes coming out of qatar we've also seen record levels of russian lng into um, the european gas market but this is how the market um, works. And my third and final point is I know that, that the whole discussion um, around feeding the beast, which Germany is blamed for and others, but we've seen in the same time uh, in, uh, under the Trump administration, um, the US spending a lot of dollars for oil imports from Russia. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kirsten. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panel for what's been a very, very stimulating discussion. Uh, there's a final point I just want to make. We did have a final question came in almost last from Professor Rasmus, Rasmus Bertelsen from the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø, who was asking uh, to Daniel uh, Kaczynski, do you fe speak in good or bad faith? And I just want to say, as far as we're concerned, there can be plenty of room for agreement or disagreement. I'm sure there will be. But I think all our panelists are speaking in good faith throughout in trying to express what they is their view that they have. And so I don't think there's a question of good or bad faith. And he also says to me that it would be appropriate to apologize to the two other panelists in the audience for uh, Mr. Kaczynski's words. And I don't intend to do that because one of the spirits of these panels is we should have uh, vigorous exchanges uh, between different points of view. And I think that's quite important to uphold as a principle. And uh, I don't think anybody should apologize to anybody else for what's been said. Uh, I can give you my own opinion as to the extent to which I agree with what's been said, but that's a different point. Uh, we want in this, and, and of course, both Sir Philip and Kirsten are entirely capable of defending themselves in relation to any points that are made without needing me to intervene in any way to deal with that. Uh, but I want to finish by thanking the panel wholeheartedly for their contribution to this discussion. I think, in a sense, the anger that's been around reflects a big reality, uh, which is that this process does uh, lead to a whole set of uh, very passionate feelings, not simply uh, here in this panel, but in the countries concerned within Germany, within Russia, within the European Union. And that's as it should be. So, I, I, uh, as I say, I say thank you all very much. This is the end of today's video panel uh, on this subject. Uh, I want to thank the audience for participating, for the questions you've sent in. I want to remind you that you'll soon be able to find a recording of this event on the Centre for Geopolitics website and to urge you to sign up to receive further information about our activities and our <laughs> Thank you all very much and good evening.